الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان السلام عليكم my friends welcome to another episode of the revelation experience I'm Miraj Mohideen today we're going to be continuing with our journey through Quran year 6 and we're going to be talking about the last attempts at reconciliation this is section 6.3 in the revelation book we're going to be looking at how the Quraysh were trying desperately trying to contain the prophet Muhammad and his growing community see remember their efforts before were primarily trying to cut down individual members who are following the Prophet, right? The vulnerable, like Bilal, like Sumeya, Sumeya's family, Yasir, and so forth. So the attempt was made to intimidate the followers of the Prophet by targeting some of the weaker people in the community. This is a very kind of mafioso mentality. Let's just like knock out some of the weak people and everyone else will get scared and they'll just run away from it because it's not worth it. The stakes are too high. Well, what they find is that instead of dissuading people, people are becoming more enamored by the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and people are growing more and more to his message. So what do they do? Well, as the desperation starts to set in for the Quraysh, they start trying to figure out how can we reconcile with him? Can we maybe make some kind of argument so that he might give up telling people to join his cause? Maybe we can compromise. So in a shift of strategy, a man by the name of Utbah ibn Rabia, see he's a leading man from that clan of Abd shams the same clan as Abu Sufyan. Utbah tries to explain to the Prophet that the revelations are not only dividing the community, it's also dishonoring their forefathers. Talking about who? Maybe he's talking about you know, Abdul Manaf and Hashim and Qusay and so forth. So what Utbah says to the Prophet Muhammad is, Oh nephew, if you are doing this with a view of getting wealth, we will join together and give you greater riches than any Qurayshi has ever possessed. If your ambition moves you, we will make you the chief of our clan. If your desire for kingship is there, we will readily offer you that too. If you are under the power of an evil spirit, which seems to haunt and dominate so that you cannot shake it off, then we shall call in a skillful physician to treat you. <laughs> so this is Utbah's last desperate attempt. Listen to how desperate it is. Basically he's saying, how much money will it take? Here's a checkbook. Give me the number. I will write you whatever you want to get you to stop. That's what Utbah is doing, right? Here's a blank check. What's the number? Now, how does the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, respond? Well, like in so many instances, he responds with the Qur'an. Because Allah is watching every single minute, every single second of what's happening in Mecca. He is there. And he is giving the Prophet Muhammad revelation in the chronological order of its revelation, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, is getting revelation. And this is where one of the most powerful surahs of the Quran comes down. Surah Al-Fussilat. Fussilat means the clear explanation. It's named after the third verse, which you will hear here in a second, about how this Quran is written in Arabic. And it's a clear language so that there is no confusion. Let's take a listen to what the surah says. The Prophet responds to this cheap offer by Utbah by saying, Hamim. This is a revelation from the compassionate, the merciful, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim. A book whose verses have been detailed in Arabic Quran for a people who know. So I'm going to start, as we go deeper into the series, start introducing you to a little bit more vocabulary. So just so that the verses that are recited by Hassan start having a deeper impact on you, a more immediate feeling. So what you're going to hear here is some words. A book whose verses, so kitabun fusilat, so the clear verses of this book, kitab means book, have been detailed in an Arabic Quran. You'll see, ayatul Quran an Arabiya. This is an Arabic Quran for a people who know. As a giver of good tidings and as a warner, but most of them turn away and they do not hear. Hamim. 
الرحمن الرحيم كتاب فصلت آياته قرآنا عربيا لقوم يعلمون بشيرا ونذيرا فأعرض أكثرهم فهم لا يسمعون The surah continues, They say, Our hearts are immune to what you are inviting us to, and our ears are deaf to what you say. There is a veil between us and you, so do whatever you like, and we'll do whatever we like as well. Right? This is kind of like the pagan, their version of Surat al-Kafirun. They're saying, you do what you want to do. Your monotheism, leave us to our paganism, is what they're saying. Now, how does the Quran respond to this kind of response? Allah instructs the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, he says, Say to them, I'm just a mortal man like you. Revelation has come down to me that compels me to say that your God is only one God. So stand firmly for him and ask for his forgiveness. Ruin to those who make partners with God, those who make no effort to cleanse themselves through charity and who reject the concept of an afterlife. However, those who believe and do what's morally right will receive a reward that will never end. أنا بشر مثلكم يوحى يوحى إلي أنما إلهكم إله واحد فاستقيموا فاستقيموا إليه واستغفروه وويل للمشركين الذين لا يؤتون الزكاة وهم بالآخرة هم كافرون إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم أجر غير ممنون Now this surah is so powerful. It's a really key surah. If you've studied the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it's impossible not to have studied Surah Al-Fussilat also because there's so much in it that talks to this Meccan experience, right? So the surah continues with the verses and it narrates the stories of creation, of previous prophets, and how communities were destroyed for not listening to the prophets. The revelation, it holds no punches. It even talks about how the Quraysh would mock the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him. And whenever he was talking, they would essentially say, you know, cover your ears and just go, la, 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 like children do, right? This is like the act of a child. That's how the Quraysh would act around the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, just like the followers of Noah and many other followers used to act around them. The Quran lays out in Surah Fussilat, it describes this behavior saying, the faithless say, don't listen to this Quran. Talk nonsense over it when it's being recited so that you can come out on top. This is how the Quran is describing the people who the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him had to deal with. And this is not just for that time. This is in every time, including our time today. The same kind of haughty, arrogant behavior of covering your ears and just making noises so that you don't have to deal with the reality. The haq. Remember we talked about Surah Al-Haq. You don't have to deal with the reality of what the Quran is saying. So the Prophet ends this conversation with Utbah, who he had originally, remember, we started this episode talking about this man, Utbah, who had come to the Prophet asking for reconciliation. The Prophet ends by explaining to Utbah the attitude of a sincere believer. Let's listen to what Surah Fussilat has to say about the attitude of a sincere believer. And while you're listening to this, remember, we're not talking about Utbah, we're talking about ourselves. So listen to this description and then see how do I Compare, how do I stack up to what the Quran is saying that I need to be? The Quran says, Among his signs are the night and the day and the sun and the moon. Ashamsu wal qamar. Don't bow down to the sun or the moon, but bow down to God who created them, if you really aim to serve him. If they're too arrogant to bow before God, it doesn't matter, because in your Lord's presence are many who have already glorified him throughout the night and the day. And they never get bored of it. 
النهار والشمس والقمر لا تسجدوا للشمس ولا للقمر واسجدوا واسجدوا لله الذي خلقهن إن كنتم إياه تعبدون فإن استكبروا فالذين عند ربك يسبحون له بالليل والنهار وهم وهم لا يسأمون. Very, very powerful ending to this surah. And you see here, Allah is saying, don't bow down, right? Don't worship the sun and the moon. Bow down to who? To Allah. Who was Allah? Allah is a samad. Remember, from Surah Al Ikhlas. We talked about this in the episode on Surah Ikhlas. Allah is a samad, which means the eternal, the everlasting. And when you hear where Allah is saying, don't bow down to the sun and the moon, I mean, well, who are you guys thinking of? Whose story are you thinking of? I mean, at this point, you can recognize I have this fixation on Abraham, Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him. Because Abraham looked at the stars and the sky and he said, this is not my Lord. This is not my Lord. I just want a relationship. I have this attachment. I need to attach this instinct to something. And I just want to be attached to as samad. I want to be attached to the thing that is always there and never disappears. And so for it should be no surprise to all of us that this Quran is in complete coherence with the story of Abraham because this Quran is taking us back to Millata Ibrahim, the way of Abraham. Now what happens to Utbah when he hears all these verses? You know, he was the guy who was basically telling the Quraysh who were all upset and how is Muhammad getting away with all of this nonsense. Utba was like, here, you know what? Hold my drink. I'm going to go talk to him. Let me show you how to get Muhammad to change. So he was very confidently swaggering out to meet Muhammad and convince him to compromise on the message that he was delivering. Well, what happens now? How does Utba react to this entire interaction with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? He's speechless. How can he respond to the verses of the Quran? I mean, you heard Hassan recite this just now. Imagine if you are a Qureshi Arab and this is your mother tongue. And not just your mother tongue in this vernacular, right? The Arabic that people speak today is very different than the Fusha or the classical Arabic of the time of the Prophet Muhammad. He's hearing this eloquence like that magically coming, right? I shouldn't use the word magically because it's not magic. Divinely coming. And Utba goes back to the Quraysh. Originally, he thought he would go back and gloat. See, I took care of business because you couldn't do it. Well, what does Utba do when he goes back to the Quraysh? He says, I have never heard words similar to those recited. They definitely relate neither to poetry nor to witchcraft, nor do they derive from soothsaying. Oh, people of Quraysh. Ya ayyuhal Quraysh. I request you to take note of my advice and grant the man full freedom to pursue his goals. <laughs> talk about a man, talk about mission impossible. There's no way you're going to convince the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, to turn away from Allah. Do you think you could have convinced Abraham or Moses to do the same? Or Jesus? No way. And the, Pro the Prophet Muhammad is no different than his prophetic brethren. Now, of course, the rest of the Quraysh are ticked off. Utbah just let them down. And they still are desperate and they need to try to figure out how to compromise. And when they go to the Prophet to repeat their offers of compromise, the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him responds, I am not possessed. Neither I seek honor amongst you nor kinship over you. He's telling them, look, there's no check that you can hand me. There's no number that will get me to compromise on this. He says, but God has sent me to you as a messenger and revealed to me a book and a commanded me that I should be for you a teller of good tidings and a warner. Even so, I have conveyed to you the message of my Lord and I have given you good counsel. If you accept from me what I have brought to you, that is your good fortune in this world and the next. But if you reject this, if you reject what I have brought, then I will patiently await for God's judgment between us. How can you argue with this person? This person is clearly solely dedicated to the well-being of his people. And you will see this time and time again with all the prophets. They say, yeah, homie, oh, my people, just follow, follow. I'm not asking anything of you. Here the prophet is echoing that. He's not asking anything of these people. 
And if anything, that only substantiates, it only validates his message. Because there's nothing else to gain from this other than the good fortune of his friends. But in response, the Quraysh cannot get over this. They are so stuck in their ways. And so they dig in their heels and they demand to see the Prophet perform miracles. It's just party tricks at this point. Why do you need miracles when you have the Quran? You guys are hearing these verses being recited by Hassan. You're hearing the beauty of it, let alone the meaning of it, let alone the rhyme, and let alone the power of the verses. That's the true miracle of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, is that he was able to deliver this book called the Qur'an, which we have in this day and age, 1400 years later, pronounced, recited the exact same way it was recited on that fateful day in Mecca, in that fateful way to Utbah. We can hear the exact words. But these people are obstinate. So much so they, th that they start quoting the Qur'an back to the Prophet. They quote Surah Al-Saba. Remember, Surah Al-Saba was the story of Sheba, the empire of Sheba, which was down in Yemen. And we've covered this in the prologue. Because in Surah Al-Saba, there is a verse where Allah says, If we wanted, we could make the earth swallow them up or cause a piece of the sky to fall down upon them. This was a threat that Allah made to the listeners in Surah Al-Saba. Well, the Quraysh use these verses and they throw it back into the Prophet's face. And they say, okay, you know what? Why don't you make the sky fall on us if you, if you say you can? If your God can make the sky fall on us? Come on, bring it. Let's see you make the sky fall upon us right now. That's the attitude of the Quraysh. And the Prophet remains unfazed to all these threats. And he just says, you know what? That is up to Allah. As he wills, he does. And as the Prophet Muhammad gets up to leave this gathering, Abdullah ibn Umayyah, another big enemy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, like a really nasty, nasty person. He says, I will not believe in you not until you take a ladder and I can see you mount it up to the heavens. Take this ladder, climb it up to the heavens, and you bring four angels down from the heavens that testify that you are who you claim to be. And even if you do that, even if you take this ladder up to the heavens, bring four angels, they come down, they all say that you are the messenger of God. Even if I see that, I still will not believe in you. Imagine the arrogance. And this Abdullah, he is the Prophet's first cousin. This Abdullah was named after the Prophet's father, Abdullah. This is a close family member of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It is the son of his aunt, Atika. And this person is an avowed enemy of Islam and is daring the Prophet Muhammad in such an arrogant way. Now, interestingly enough, we will see many years later that at the conquest of Mecca, this very Abdullah who held off for 20 years will rush out of Mecca to greet the Prophet Muhammad before he enters Mecca. And at that point, at the 11th hour and the 59th minute before the conquest of Mecca, he finally sees the truth of the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, sees the truth of this Quran and embraces the message. So what we're seeing here in these interactions and what I'm really trying to drive home is the attitude of the Prophet's opposition, their arrogance. And it's really, there's no better word for it for, than just arrogance, their willful blindness, which is a whole topic I hope to get into in future episodes, this idea of willful blindness. The fact that when people refuse to believe in something because of some deep emotional connection to what they currently believe in, it's almost impossible to get them to shift uh, directions. We see this all the time in our current day and age, and this is no less a reality back then. Uh, I'll give you one more example of the type of interactions the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had with the people around him. In another incident, there was a man by the name of Ubay ibn Khalaf. He was so mean to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his attitude typifies a lot, the attitude of a lot of the Meccans towards the Prophet and his followers. And remember, this is not unique to Muhammad, peace be upon him. This is something that Jesus also experienced, the abuse uh, that Jesus experienced, the abuse that 
Noah experienced, that Abraham experienced by his own father. This is part of what it means to be a prophet. And this is the fulfillment of Waraqah's statement to the prophet when he said that your people will throw you out because you are calling them back to the truth. So in this situation right here, Ubay goes to the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him and ridicules him. And what he does is he, he grabs a dried out bone, probably like a camel bone or something like that. And he crumbles the bone in his hand and he blows the dust into the Prophet's face. I mean, just the arrogance of that kind of behavior. And he says to the Prophet, do you claim Muhammad that God is going to bring this back to life? And he blows it into the Prophet's face. And the Prophet replies very gently, Even so, I claim that he will raise it, and you too, when you are as this is now. And then he will enter you into the fire. The Quran speaks to these kinds of interactions. And we see this in one of the most famous surahs in the Quran, in Surah Al Yasin. The surah says, doesn't the human being see that we created him from a single drop, right? Like Surah Al-Alaq, man was created from a drop, yet he's clearly defiant. He sets up depictions of us, all the while forgetting his own creation. He asks, who can bring old rotted bones back to life? Say to him, the one who gave them life the first time will give them life again, for he knows about every type of creation. He's the one who can produce a fire from green trees when you kindle it. Doesn't the one who created the heavens and the earth have the power to create something like a human being again? Definitely. He is the creator and the knowing. أَوَلَمْ يَرَ الْإِنسَانُ أَنَّا خَلَقْنَاهُ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمٌ مُّبِينٌ وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا وَنَسِيَ خَلْقَهُ قَالَ مَنْ يُحْيِي الْعِظَامَ وَهِيَ رَمِيمٌ قُلْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةٍ وهو بكل خلق عليم الذي جعل لكم من الشجر الأخضر نارا فإذا أنتم منه توقدون أوليس الذي خلق السماوات والأرض بقادر على أن يخلق مثلهم بلى وهو الخلاق العليم so I'm going through all of these passages in the Quran today because one, I just love listening to it. I love Hassan's recitation of it. It's just, to me, my favorite part of this entire experience is just listening to Hassan's recitation. The second reason is because I really want to set up the scene for what's going to happen in the next episode. Okay, The Quraysh are desperate. You can feel their desperation. You can hear it in their arrogance. You know, the times when people get the most defensive and they lash out the most, it's usually a sign of desperation. And thirdly, the, I wanted to just show you how the Qur'an is always there to defend the Prophet. The Qur'an is always there to guide the Prophet, to reassure the Prophet, peace be upon him. And we have to look to the Qur'an as a source of defense, reassurance, and guidance for us as well. This is not something that is just limited to 7th century Arabia. This is guidance for us to live in a world of arrogance today, to live in a world where people are laughing and mocking and making fun of the choices that you may make or the choices that I may make. And this is guidance to say, you know what? Maybe we too are living in an early Meccan period where Islam is a stranger or not even Islam, monotheism, belief in a godly based life is really a stranger in this world right now. And we have to have forbearance. We have to have sabr, which doesn't mean remember just drumming your fingers on the table. Sabr means persevering and marching on. So I want to end this episode now with the closing verses that I close in every verse. And today I thought I would explain it in a little bit more detail because we just talked about Surah Al-Fussilat and Surah Al-Fussilat was very clear when it was addressing 
Utba ibn Rabia saying that the people who believe in Allah, one, establish straightness, follow the straight way. It uses the word, the same word as Sirat al Mustaqim, Istiqama, who establish that straightness, right? And who do good deeds, who give charity, right? These people who fulfill these obligations, what will they get for this? They have will have a reward that is eternal, never ending. That's what Surah Al Fusilat said, which I recited to you. Well, the closing verses that I use in every episode are actually some of my favorite verses, and they come from Surah Al Ahkaf. And for me, it's just like a really happy verse because it shows you the promise that Allah has for people who follow His way. So the verse says, Inna ladina qalu Rabban Allahu. Indeed, those who have said, our Lord is Allah, and remained on a right course, again, the word astaqamu, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ There will be no fear, nor will they grieve. The very thing that God promised Adam. This is the Adam promise, remember? Whoever follows my guidance will have nothing to fear, nor will you grieve. We talked about that in like the second episode a long time ago. Here God is coming through in that promise. Follow these things. Believe. Establish a straight way. You'll have nothing to fear, nor will you grieve. Of course the Quran is completely coherent. Because this entire message from Adam... All the way down to Muhammad is the exact same message. And then the second verse says, Those are the companions of paradise, abiding eternally therein as a reward for what they used to do. So with that, we'll end this episode. I can't wait to see you guys in the next episode where we talk about a very important moment in the end of the early Meccan period. For now, let's hear Hassan's recitation of these last verses I mentioned from Surah Al-Ahqaf. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ أُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ